Okay, everybody, in this video, we're going to go through fission and fusion for your CIE IGCSE physics course. Um, so what you basically need to know is that the idea of what actually happens during fission and fusion, uh, you need to know the differences between them, um, and we'll think about some stuff in terms of the actual nucleons themselves and what happens there inside the nucleus. Okay, so if you remember, um, the key goal of unstable nuclei so that's nuclei with basically the wrong uh, number of protons or neutrons. Their goal is to get to this blue line called the stability curve. And in the previous couple of lessons, we looked at alpha, beta and gamma as three ways that nuclei can become more stable. But it turns out that as well as doing that, they can actually, uh, a nucleus can actually break apart entirely um, and become two completely new things. Um, so what it could do is it can go from being one nucleus by itself. It would help if I could actually click the thing I'm trying to click. Um, it can go from being one nucleus by itself, let's say somewhere over here, and it can turn into one nucleus here and one nucleus here. So two lighter nuclei. Um, so it basically looks like this. Now, if you remember, we always say that we start with the parent nucleus, um, and I might call it AZX. Um, and then I'm just going to get up some, uh, some some new letters. So I'm going to call this A1, Z1, Y, and A2, Z2. Probably shouldn't use Z because Z's already been taken. So let's go for smiley face. This is going to be an atom of smileyum, which God knows we could all do with right now. If you think back to what we talked about when we were thinking about decay equations, um, is there anything you can say about A1 and A2 compared to A, um, and Z1 and Z2 compared to Z? Well, hopefully you can say that A is equal to A1 plus A2, and Z is equal to Z1 plus Z2. In other words, same as before, um, Whatever number of total nucleons we have at the start, that has to be the same at the end. So you can balance these nuclear equations quite easily. Now, one of the useful things for us uh, as humans is we can actually cause fission to happen. So I want you to imagine that you've got an atom sitting here, perfect, let's choose a better color, perfectly on the stability curve. So it's nice and happy. Um, in reality, it wouldn't be perfect on the stability curve for this to work. Um, it'd be slightly off it, but we're just going to assume that we've got a nice, happy, well-behaved atom. Well, what we can, what we know um, is that there are certain uh, atoms for which when they break apart, when they go through fission, they release energy. And we as humans like energy. We can use energy to boil water, to make steam, to turn a turbine, to make electricity. So what we want to try to do is force fission to happen. Um, and there's a cool thing that we can do here. If you imagine neutrons, as we've talked about before, neutrons are neutrally charged. So there's nothing to stop them if we whack them hard enough at a nucleus from joining that nucleus. Now if that happens, it's going to move, obviously I'm vastly exaggerating it, it's going to move my atom up the NZ graph because the number of protons have stayed the same but it's now gained an extra neutron. And if you look where I've redrawn this, it's now away from the stability curve. And if we pick the right atom and we hit it in the right way, then uh, and we particularly do this with uh, a type of uranium called uranium-235, or is it 231? I'll just check for you. Um, 
It then splits into two smaller nuclei and, quite helpfully, some neutrons. And that product, uh, sorry, that, that, that uh, fission releases loads and loads of heat energy. And we can use that heat energy for power. So, oh, it was uranium-235. Hooray. Um, now, the fact that I said over here, and some neutrons, that's the really key bit and the reason why we like uranium-235. Uranium-235 has this pretty cool property um, that if you hit it with a neutron and you cause it to become very, very momentarily uranium-236, then it will almost immediately fish, fish up, fish, undergo fission, can't say fish, fission, I don't know, I'm losing my mind already, this is not a good start. Um, it will undergo fission and it will become uh, Krypton-92 and Barium-141. Now, if you look, 92 plus 141 plus 1 from the neutron that hit it is not equal to 235. We're missing three neutrons. So what happens? Well, those three leftover neutrons also get expelled and they fly off and they can hit more uranium atoms. Now, because there are three of these uh, neutrons coming out, one uranium atom splitting can cause three uranium atoms to also be split. And then those three, each of those three new ones can cause three more to split. So what you, we get is exponential increase in the rate of uh, reaction, which if we don't control it, is used to make an atomic bomb. Because within a fraction of a second, you will have trillions and trillions of atoms fissioning, all of them releasing heat energy, so all of them releasing a huge amount of energy, um, and that very, very quickly becomes a bomb. Just to give you an idea of what that of how that works, um, I'm going to put a link uh, in this video for you to watch another video, um, which will just give you a real idea about it. It's one of my favourite uh, videos to so look, so just have a watch of that. Okay, now one thing that you need to know is that the neutrons produced by uranium-235 fission, they're actually too fast to be absorbed by another nuclei. So if we had a fast neutron going through, um, if I, let's just do here a fast neutron, that one will just pass straight past the uh, uranium nucleus and it won't uh, enter it. It won't join with it, so it won't cause any more fission. So we have to find a way of slowing the neutrons down. Turns out once the neutrons are slow enough, they can be absorbed by the uh, uranium atom or the uranium nucleus. So what we have to use is the concept of a moderator. And a moderator is something that just slows down neutrons. Um, the most common one is water. Uh, sometimes we also use graphite as well. CIE are weirdly particular about you knowing that, so you have to understand the idea of a moderator is to slow down the neutrons so they can be absorbed by uh, nuclei. So I touched on earlier the idea of controlled versus uncontrolled nuclear fission. Uh, if we have controlled, um, then we get a nuclear reactor, which can be used for power. If it's uncontrolled, then we get a bomb. So it's important that we're able to do so. Um, so what we have to do is, is to have a device that can control and steady our rate of nuclear fission. So if you remember what's going on inside the uh, reactor, we have uranium-235. That's absorbing a neutron. And that is becoming two daughter nuclei and three neutrons. Now all of that is happening inside the reactor. We also have the moderator in there because the moderator will slow down those three neutrons, uh, making them slow enough to be absorbed. The missing piece of the puzzle is this idea here of control rods. Now, what control rods do is they can absorb these neutrons. So they can get rid of some of the neutrons that are produced. Um, they're usually made of boron. 
because boron stays very stable. Um, if you absorb, if boron absorbs an extra neutron, it doesn't become radioactive itself, and it certainly doesn't undergo fission. So what you can do is you can completely control your rate of reaction by dropping these control rods down into your reactor. As the control rods push deeper into the reactor, they absorb more of these neutrons. If they're absorbing lots of neutrons, and those neutrons can't go on to cause more fission reactions, so the reaction slows down. If your reactor starts to get too cool, you can pull the control rods back up, um, and then those neutrons will be able to go on, hit more atoms, and fission more often. Um, so the deeper you put in your control rods, the quick, the slower, sorry, the slower your nuclear reaction will be. And if you want to shut down your nuclear reactor, you can put the control rods all the way in, and that will be enough to prevent any neutrons from flying around, um, and you'll very, very quickly stop your reaction. Um, you also need to know the basic structure of a uh, reactor. So we have uh, the uranium fuel sits inside the reactor with the control rods slotting into it. You also have moderators in there. That might be water that's just sloshing about, um, or it could be uh, graphite. Um, around it, you have a very thick containment vessel. Um, so that will be uh, lead to stop the gamma rays that are produced, uh, and also several uh, meters of concrete uh, to absorb any neutrons, anything else that may escape. Inside, after the reactors uh, produces heat, obviously we have to do something with that heat. So what you normally do is you pump it uh, through uh, pipes. So you, you have the reactor surrounded by water. Um, some reactors use other substances, but let's keep it simple and say they use pressurized water. Um, now that water is going to become radioactive because that water is uh, exposed to lots of things that will become radioactive. It will also absorb neutrons itself. And if water absorbs neutrons, it won't be stable anymore and it will become radioactive. Um, so that water, you don't really want mixing and going to too many places. So then we have this thing here called a heat exchanger. So you pump the super hot water through these pipes. They go into the heat exchanger. They boil the water in here. And then the water goes off to drive a turbine to drive a generator to make you electricity. And that's how nuclear power works. Um, and in nuclear power production, uh, we are left with uh, two types of radioactive waste. Um, small nuclei from fission, um, they're very radioactive, so the daughter nuclei, um, and also stuff in the uh, around the nuclear power station uh, in the side of the reactor, they will also absorb neutrons from the fission process, um, and that will make them unstable. Um, thinking about half-lives, the daughter nuclei, they have a very long half-life. Uh, we're talking thousands of years here. Um, the stuff that surrounds it, that has a relatively short half-life. So the standard procedure when we get rid of a nuclear power station is the actual old fuel, the stuff that's really got a really long half-life, that has to be sealed in glass and buried somewhere for thousands and thousands of years. We haven't really worked out what to do with nuclear waste yet um, because we haven't really found a way that we can guarantee will be safe for thousands of years because we've only had nuclear power for about 50 years. Um, for the shorter to half-life waste, um, that's a bit easier. Although it's very, very dangerous nuclear waste at first because it has lots of activity, because its half-life is short, we tend to just keep it in a big pond of water, uh, making sure that it can't escape anywhere, and you just wait about 30, 40 years, and then usually its activity will have dropped enough that it's safe to just be got rid of um, with normal waste um, because the half-life means that its eventually its activity will drop to being barely noticeable. Very quickly, I'm just going to talk about nuclear fusion. So nuclear fission is a big nucleus breaking into two smaller nuclei. There's also an idea of nuclear fusion. In nuclear fusion, we take two light nuclei, usually hydrogen, and we force them together. And when we force them together, we make a new atom again, and that can also release energy. And the general rule is that light nuclei, things like hydrogen, um, when they fuse, they give out energy. 
heavy nuclei when they fission they give out energy um, and that's all you need to know for CIE now you just need to know that if you join together light nuclei energy comes out if you break apart heavy nuclei energy comes out if you're interested the cutoff point is iron anything heavier than iron will give out energy by fissioning anything lighter than iron will give out energy by fusioning um, and if you want to know why look forward to doing A-level physics and I will explain it all to you in loving detail when we go over a concept called binding energy per nucleon. But for CIE, uh, IGCSE, you don't need to worry yourself about that. Okay, have a go now for me at uh, some Isaac Physics work and then come back to me with any questions you might have. Thanks very much.